distinguished guests, dear colleagues and dear students, uh, I would like to start by welcoming you all to Izmir University of Economics on behalf of our rector, uh, welcome. Uh, the names in the conference uh, roster are too good to be true. A lot of my personal heroes are here in this room and we feel incredibly honored and incredibly privileged to have you here. Uh, we pride ourselves in having a department in economics that is strong in political economy. Indeed, we believe this is our distinguishing feature among uh, the other uh, departments in Turkey. Uh, I, I mean, it is. I, I feel almost speechless to uh, have all of you here. I know this is due to John Weeks, and I'm sure to run help him a lot. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome back. Uh, John has visited us before a few years ago. He was our distinguished guest in a conference we organized. And uh, to run, thanks for uh, getting, uh, taking care of all the details of organizing an event like this. He warned me not to speak too long, and I am also impatient to uh, listen to you and hear what you have to say as much as my schedule permits. So welcome again, and I hope you have a very good time in Israel. I hope you have a very productive workshop, and I hope you come back. Um, I want to thank the university and um, uh, for organizing this up. This is the third conference I've been at uh, this university, and they're always very well um, uh, organized. And uh, with um, many um, uh, distinguished uh, speakers, and thank you for the following comment. I think Mr. Reagan has a turn has done a tremendous amount, and uh, any of the organization should, all of it should be, uh, was overseen uh, uh, by him, which is, should be obvious since I wasn't here, but also just because I was not very helpful. I apologize for that. But uh, I think we should thank Dora. Um, a few um, brief comments um, about what um, uh, you might say the ground rules and uh, what I hope are a few insights. This is a workshop, it's not a conference, so it's not something that you come along to and you give your paper and then you, uh, as a performance and a few comments so afterwards and then you uh, uh, try to um, answer or, or dismiss them as uh, quickly as possible and you end up uh, uh, the same door you came in. But what we're hoping is over this period that we'll learn from each other and, um, that, and the papers will become improved uh, as, a, uh, as a result of that. Um, in that context, the length of the presentations, uh, Troy has suggested 45 minutes. I thought that that was too much, but I will accept 45 minutes. Uh, not a second longer, let me say. I'll, uh, I'll be chairing today. Uh, Al Campbell will be chairing on Wednesday and Ben on um, uh, Friday. And uh, either I will do it or I'll let someone else do it on Thursday. The rules will be you get a warning in five minutes, you get a warning in one minute. In the one minute, I will answer questions, <coughs> even if you're in the middle of a sentence. Um, uh, third, cell phones. Please turn them off. Uh, we're, um, uh, unless, uh, I think you can. Talk to your broker later. Um, the, um, if everyone, when you give your paper, and I'll try to do this, will begin with a, say, a one sentence main point. The main point of my paper is, and the second sentence is how the paper relates to the topic of the workshop in the book. So, and because we want everything to be, uh, relate to that, that's um, the, uh, the focus. We have a focus, and we, and like everyone, to tell us how they see their paper related to that purpose. Final point I would make is statistics and worksheets. It's now become a uh, standard practice that when you have empirical work, that along with your paper, you provide the uh, uh, not only the statistics and the spreadsheets, but an explanation of how you got from the raw data to the end point. I think here, whatever uh, criticism anyone may have of Protecta, he is, and should stand as an example to us of how that type of scholarship is 
done. And so even the Financial Times peeking over his data could not, uh, their, refu their attacks were very lame indeed because he had been very careful to uh, explain everything he did. And I think we need to do uh, the same thing so that no one says, well, it all depends on how you, how you measure it. We don't know how so and so uh, measured it. But we'll begin and end on time. And um, the, um, uh, uh, to that end, I'll pass it over to Turin, uh, organizer of my own thoughts. Um, uh, Ayla and John said it all. There's nothing to <laughs> tell me. So, uh, and also from experience, I know that the best opening speeches are the shortest ones. Uh, so, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm truly honored to have you here. And I hope that we will have a very productive time here, four days. So, I will be dealing some technical issues like internet, etc. We are trying to sort out them, and I will be informing you about these issues. So, let's get started. I mean, so, are you going to come here and present here? Uh, yes, I suppose. Uh, you may have a computer here. You may have a okay, point. yeah, I guess uh, that would probably be the best thing. If you wish to sit here, you can. We're ahead of time, that's right. <laughs> so John gets 15 extra minutes. Yes, exactly. Free Friday. We have two cameras, and I think the idea is that in this modern age, it's going to be on YouTube, I guess, by the university. So, um, uh, you know, put on your uh, yeah, right. uh, television makeup and uh, uh, generally prepare yourself. I should probably go Okay, let me just test this. Okay.
of time. This first diagram shows the U.S. GMP variations from the trend since 1929. This is a simple uh, logarithmic trend was taken, and uh, then the actual values subtracted from the or as percentage of the uh, uh, trend values. And if we look at it, it's pretty obvious that there were only two periods uh, in uh, for the U.S. over the last um, uh, 85 years that could remotely be considered crises. There were ups and downs, certainly, but since between uh, 1946 and 1989, in one year, in only one year, was USGNP below its trend value, and that's in uh, 1980, and then it was uh, less than 1% below its trend, uh, its trend value. The other thing to note from this uh, diagram is that the U.S. economy began to slow down quite early in the 1990s, so while the, recent, the current ongoing crisis struck it, suddenly it was already in decline. And I'll try to draw some uh, implications of that. I'm comparing this to the U.K. The U.K. is the only other country for which we have a long time series on GNP going back to 1929. Well, there are some others that we do, but they don't make any sense to use them. Germany, for example. Uh, but because there was so much uh, destruction during the war and post-war recovery, um, it really doesn't make sense to have a long run trend. And we can see that the U.S. pattern, the U.K. pattern, is quite different from the U.S. pattern. The U.K. has this long depressed period in the early 1950s, going all the way through the 1950s, then another one in the early 1980s, neither of which the U.S. shows. And the downturn relative to the trend came much later, about 10 years later. And the interesting thing is if you do a analysis comparing the U.S. and the U.K. They are the closest of the ones that move together. But I'm going to go on to some other uh, developed uh, countries. They are the closest, and they're, uh, it's significant, but quite low. If you just do a simple-minded regression of first differences, the, um, uh, uh, it is significant for uh, uh, the, uh, the number of observations, but the correlation is about 0 0.09. This shows the U.S. in four high-income countries, and uh, U.S., France, Italy, U.K., Japan, a much shorter period going back to 1950. Again, we see two distinct patterns one is the U.S. and the U.K., which stick pretty much around their um, uh, trend values, and the other three that go through this long post-war recovery, and then a decline from that uh, recovery. So uh, different patterns driving the two sets of uh, countries. This is um, the middle income country. This would be Brazil, China. Well, uh, uh, China is not included in this long swing because it didn't become capitalist until the, uh, at the earliest, uh, I would say, the early 1990s. Uh, so <clears throat> this would be Brazil, Turkey, um, Mexico, uh, and um, Korea. Russia. Uh, the Russian one is included in a later one for the same reason it didn't become capitalist until the early 1990s. And so again, we see quite a different pattern from the U.S., from middle income countries. In fact, that after about 1985, there's almost an inverse relationship between movements.
was in the U.S. economy and movements and GDP in the middle income countries. I've also done this for the individual countries, three Latin American countries. Uh, um, uh, I don't uh, want to bore you with um, showing uh, all of those um, uh, diagrams. But there are none of the middle income countries which have a pattern after 1985, similar to that of the U.S. But before 1985, you can see a similarity. Uh, <clears throat> this is U.S. and five high income countries. And the purpose of this diagram is to inspect, thank you, is to inspect the economic crisis. And here you might say, the, the, the moral is, they all went down together, but after that, they behaved differently. So you get, you get this quite uh, striking recovery of Germany. Of course, now Germany's had a, a, a reversal. You've got uh, the beginning of a recovery in Japan, but a continued downward trend for the other countries. So we see a very mixed pattern. And this is uh, the US and several Asian countries beginning in the early 1990s. And though the, for example, the Chinese economy slows down, we have to remember what it's slowing down from, uh, from uh, uh, <coughs> over a decade of going at 10% a year. So now in the Chinese, Capitalists are carrying their hair because they're growing at 6.8% uh, this year. I think most other countries would be only too delighted to have that outcome. Uh, and um, they, uh, while uh, s slight similarity in the case of Korea, but none whatsoever in the case of uh, uh, Indonesia. Latin American countries, we're just about to the end of these. Again, to demonstrate that the U.S. is no longer the driver of the world economy. You have Argentina, Brazil, Mexico. Only Mexico moves, you might say, in sympathy with the U.S. economy. The others, again, we see almost an inverse uh, of a relationship. And this is in, uh, again, 1994 through the current, the current quarter. And I'll finish up the empirical part for but the analytical part uh, with two diagrams showing U.S., Germany, and China. I would think it's a fairly obvious point that in order to be a world power, a growing world power, you have to run a trade surplus. The reason is you can't have expanding foreign investment if you don't have a current account surplus. And a current account deficit signals the decline of great power. It was true of Britain, and as you see in the United States, there's been a very long term, uh, well, this is a, this is 1990, uh, 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 shows the uh, uh, <coughs> annual trade balance, and it's very negative indeed. And of course, Germany and China are very positive, with, with China until recently, for about five years, had the largest trade surplus in the world. Now it sort of switches between China uh, and Germany. Okay. Now we go back. My list. And make a few quick points. Because we have the paper which you read or can read. First of all, I think we need a theoretical definition of a crisis. Uh, 
I think that there are some, both uh, not necessarily Marxist, but others, that whenever there is a cycle, a downturn, it's a crisis. So there's the view that in the late, some say in the 1970s, there was a crisis of the U.S. economy. Some say it was in 1980. I think both are wrong. I think the empirical evidence does not sustain that. There's certainly a slowdown in growth. There must be a difference. I would have thought there should be a difference between slowing down growth and a, um, uh, a crisis. Or if there isn't, we're going to need some new words to describe these things. Big crises, little crises, systemic crises, passing crises, and so on. I think if we use the same term to refer to the 1930s, the 1970s, 1980s, and 2008 afterwards, if we use the same word for all of those, um, we are going to have to have some kind of modifier uh, for those, because certainly what happened in the 30s and what happened since 2008, I think by any measure, you don't have to use my measure, by any measure are different from what happened in the 70s and 80s. Plus, the mainstream has some quite convincing explanations about what happened in the 1970s and 1980s. 1970s with the increase in um, uh, petroleum uh, prices. Most of us here, not all of us, most of us here are old enough to remember that. Uh, and when, um, uh, I can remember when I, when I um, <laughs> went to, uh, the last year I was at the University of Texas, 1965, you could buy gasoline at 19 cents a gallon. Um, they uh, even adjusted for inflation, that would be less than a dollar uh, uh, now. Uh, okay, that's the first point. We need different definitions. Second of all, uh, in the interest of accuracy and in the interest of avoiding being US centric and Euro centric, or even developed country centric, we need to have, well, first thing to do is stop referring to a crisis of the US economy as a global crisis, because it isn't. It may turn into one, but you can't take the statistics from the United States and say this shows a global crisis. You have to demonstrate that it passes to the other countries of the world. And that requires the next uh, step. Uh, what is a transfer mechanism? What theoretical explanation do we have of why, if there is a global crisis, if we're going to use that uh, term, beyond the financial crisis, let me say, that certainly was uh, virtually uh, global, though not total. Again, there's some very big countries where at least did not have financial crises. Germany being the most uh, uh, obvious one, but also France. Uh, <coughs> the, um, <coughs> so the, well, the, even the financial part of it didn't hit every country. But if we're going to talk about a global crisis, we need to have some explanation of how it gets started, first of all, from it gets started, then how is it passed to the others. Now, uh, I might say mainstream uh, not mainstream, we were mainstream, but you might call uh, those inspired by the Keynesian tradition. I, I try not to use Keynesian economics anymore. I feel that that's rather like referring to uh, Copernican astronomy, uh, because what Keynesian economics means to me is that uh, uh, at the aggregate level, the macro level, um, the economy is a demand constraint, and I would have thought that that is Anyone who is not a complete neoclassical has to accept that. And you don't have to be a Keynesian or a Marxist or a Ricardian or an institutionalist or a devil worshiper, whatever you happen to be. Market economies at the aggregate level are demand constraint. Okay, now, if you want to go beyond that, then you need some explanation of uh, 
which relates to some underlying process in the relations and force of production. There are several candidates uh, which I would say are non-starters, or uh, you can um, uh, uh, you can reject as a transfer mechanism. You might use it country by country, so you reject as a transfer mechanism. Falls in the rate of profit. That is ones that that aren't demand related. That whatever your explanation happens to be whether it's the old crude rising so-called organic composition of capital or some other uh, variation on it, uh, the uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, variation. I, I can't imagine how you would argue that it would hit everybody at the same time. But if, you have an if you have an argument like that, it must relate to the stage of capitalism you're in, past rates of growth, past rates of investment, size of the manufacturing sector, a whole range of things. So the idea that an underlying systemic fall in the rate of profit would occur simultaneously in the United States, the UK, Germany, Japan, um, I think um, uh, there may be an explanation. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, what it uh, what it would be, uh, but I'm uh, open to that. My the most empirically promising of these is one I would reject on theoretical grounds, and that would be Luxembourg's thesis. If you agree, I mean, if you agree with her that the problem in capitalism is uh, overproduction, and you need a non-capitalist portion of the economy where you sell the um, uh, where you realize what you can't realize in the capitalist sector. That could happen to all capitalist countries at the same time. The unfortunate thing is it's wrong, of course. And even if it isn't theoretically wrong, there's not enough non-capitalist sectors left in the world to be of a significant uh, uh, impact. Okay. Decline of the U.S. I'll finish up on this. I think actually this is extremely important because it marks a, uh, a new era in the global economy in which the U.S. economy is still extremely important to three powerful countries uh, on a world uh, scale. But it is just as in military matters, it can no longer determine the course of events. It can no longer determine the economic course of events. That's mostly obvious in Latin America, where that the U.S. is no longer even the largest trading partner of uh, the larger uh, Latin American countries. Either it's China or it's uh, one of the European countries. So the, um, I think that this requires some adjustment of um, the, our view of what drives the, uh, the world economy. And the, you put this together, and I think it, indicates the importance of viewing the global crisis globally. And I'm going to stop at that point and I'll open it uh, to uh, discussion. Okay. You chair this one, I'll do the other one. Oops. Okay. Okay, any questions or comments? Uh, John? Yeah. Is the speaker working? Yeah, you can speak. Yeah, press it and read it. Now it's working. It has yeah. to be read. Yes. Uh, appropriate for this conference. Yes. Uh, I had a question about, about the data. Uh, you, you chose to uh, represent the long run uh, uh, movement of these economies by. Uh, the, by the uh, uh, change from long-run trends, uh, yeah. rather than the commonly used uh, ups and downs in the current outputs. Uh, the uh, use of uh, deviation from long-run trends